Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in. The book is about the Jesuit order and their history and uh, a whole host of subjects pertinent to the understanding of God's people today who are trying to figure out what this new world order is all about. And talking about the history of the Jesuits, we're talking about the gunpowder plot of 1605, where the Jesuits conspired with many conspirators to blow up the British Parliament and to overthrow the Protestant government of Great Britain and to solicit even the help of the Spanish army to overthrow after the uh, the, uh, the bombing of the uh, British Parliament. One of these conspirators was a Jesuit priest. We're talking specifically about Henry Garnet, uh, S.J., Jesuit priest, and he's on trial. The uh, gunpowder plot was discovered before the dastardly deed was accomplished, and uh, the, co- the uh, conspirators were rounded up. Henry Garnet, this, the uh, Jesuit priest, was one of the main conspirators. And he tried to defend himself by claiming the sanctity of the, san- of the uh, confessional box, his privilege as a priest not to divulge the plot to destroy Parliament. And uh, we're reading now about that case and what a flimsy defense he offered. And uh, Henry Garnett was eventually convicted of conspiracy to overthrow the government, and he was drawn, hanged, drawn, and quartered. But claiming the sanctity of the, the confessional box was his main defense, and we'll continue where we left off yesterday. It must be further noted that the defense upon which Garnet uh, Garnet seeks to rely is based on a falsehood. Talking about the sanctity of the confessional box, it it continues, for the seal of confession is subject to Canon 21 of the Fourth Lateran Council of 1215, binding on the whole Roman Catholic Church, which lays down the obligation of secrecy in the following words, listen carefully. Let the priest absolutely beware that he is not by word or sign or by any other manner whatsoever in any way betray the sinner. But if he should happen to need wiser counsel, let him cautiously seek that counsel without any mention of the person. Unquote. Thus, Henry Garnet, as a Catholic priest, even by the standards of the twisted Jesuit moral theology of the Fourth Lateran Council, was obliged, under Canon 21, to seek wiser counsel cautiously without mention of Garnet. In other words, he was free to warn Parliament and the King and all concerned of a plot to blow up Parliament and to kill all the parliamentarians and the king and his family. So there was no, the the argument of the sanctity of the confessional box is no argument. So, and it says, by all normal humane standards of morality, he was required to do even more than that, even if by private or anonymous means, he was morally obliged to at least warn of the plot. And uh, hang on a second, I may have a better connection here. Okay, I have a connection on Skype now. I apologize for the brief problem with the audio. I was on the telephone. Now I'm on a better connection. So, Garnett was bound even by Roman Catholic canon law, to divulge to the king and parliament of this plot to blow up parliament. He had no excuse, not even by the twisted moral standards of the Jesuits. 
Now, according to the Jesuit scholar, Cardinal Robert Bellamine, who was also a Jesuit, he says this, If the person confessing be concealed, it is lawful for a priest to break the seal of confession in order to avert a great calamity. So here we have even a, a, a disagreement by another Jesuit priest that on the basis of the tr- of the horror of this of this uh, plot, still the priest had a moral obligation to break the seal of the confession. And it says, but more damningly, the Jesuits had themselves previously quote propounded a doctrine that there are circumstances in which the confessor, that is the priest hearing the confession, may oblige his penitent to discover or to disclose his accompliceness, his accomplices, or to permit him, the priest, to inform the competent authorities of the crime. So the further we go, the more ridiculous uh, Henry Garnett's uh, defense is. Even more conclusive is the fact that the details concerning the treasonous plot were also revealed to Garnet, as he himself admitted by Catesby and Jesuit Greenwell, both of whom conferred with him upon, uh, thereupon, upon the plot, in the presence and hearing of other parties, and not just in the confessional. So it was widely discovered that that Garnet had discovered or had uh, discussed the plot, even in his own handwriting, outside of the confessional. And it says, in, e- in any event, as Lord Chelmsford, uh, Chelmsford, a previous Lord Chancellor, observed, quote, the law was clear. A Catholic priest had no privilege at all to withhold such facts, which came under his knowledge in the confession. And the English judge, Lord Westbury, had previously confirmed in R versus Constance Kent, quote, there can be no doubt that in a suit or criminal procedure, a clergyman is not privileged so as to decline to answer a question which is put to him for the purpose of justice on the ground of his answer would reveal something that he had known in confession. He is compelled to answer such a question, and the law of England does not extend the privilege of refusing to answer to Roman Catholic clergymen in dealing with a person of their own persuasion. All right, they can't even protect Catholics with this bogus uh, sanctity of the confessional box. Garnet lied when claiming to have, when he claimed to have only known of the plot of Guy Fox, who was an explosives expert, and who had served with the Spanish army, he had no uh, justification to protect Guy Fox through the confessional. And it says the evidence proved his extensive involvement with the plot, his knowledge of it both in and out of the confessional, and his influential and active collaboration with all the conspirators. In fact, the philosopher Voltaire confides that, quote, whenever a prince of Orange or a king of France was to be assassinated, the Jesuit assassins always prepared himself by the, by the sacrament of confession, and he adds sarcastically that the Jesuit assassins use confessions as gluttons take to medicines to increase their appetite, unquote. So here we see Voltaire sarcastically ridiculing this idea of the sanctity of the confessional box and the sacrament of confession, so-called by the Roman Catholic Church, as a means to at least in themselves justify their crimes and receive absolution for their sin even before they commit it. And that it became a folly among the Jesuit priests. <clears throat> okay, I'm getting some feedback somewhere. I'm not sure where that's coming from. Okay, now... <clears throat> Excuse me, I'll continue. 
So the Jesuits used the confessional box like a glutton. And it became a moral out for them. Now, if there were any sanctity whatsoever in the confessional box, even if Christ had ever sanctioned that a man should confess his sins to another sinful man to obtain absolution, the Jesuits have abused it beyond its pretended purpose. The confessional box is an aberration, and in no way, shape, or form can it be considered a tenet of the faith of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Jesus. It goes all the way back to Babylon, and it wasn't even commonly practiced in the Roman Catholic Church until the creation of the Jesuit order in 1540. The Jesuit order was the one that made confession a sacrament of the Roman Catholic Church, and it's an abomination even to common sense. But here, these Jesuits and their conspirators used the sanctity of this abomination to justify the holding of this secret to blow up Parliament. Okay, notable examples, we're talking about this gluttonous use of the confessional box. Notable examples being the lawyer uh, Belthazer, uh, Gerard, uh, alias Francis Guyon, the assassin of William I, Prince of Orange, and, of course, Ravillac, who assassinated Henry IV. This most illustrious prince of Europe was stabbed in his carriage on narrow Rue de la Ferronnerie, and like the above assassins, Guy Fawkes and his conspirators all took secret oaths and received the sacrament of the Eucharist of the Church in preparation for the plot involving the said Henry Garnet, John Gerard, Oswald Tessman, and other Jesuits. So there's how their gluttonous use of, of this confessional box has resulted in innumerable assassinations and other crimes, too numerous to mention. Now, coming back to Garnet's trial, shortly before the said grand opening of Parliament on November 5th, 1605, the date the plotters intended to blow it up, Garnet organized a pilgrimage to St. Winifred's Well in Wales, which started from Sir uh, Everard Digby's house in Buckinghamshire and stopped on its way at the houses of John Grant and Robert Winter, three of the main conspirators. Moreover, during the pilgrimage, Garnet asked the company of pilgrims to pray, quote, for some good success for the Catholic cause at the beginning of Parliament, unquote. That Garnet was privy, if not a party, to the murderous plot is ipso facto. Thus we're left to wonder, when Garnet denied direct involvement in the plot, was he denying involvement as Garnet or Wally, or Darcy, or as Roberts, or as Farmer, or as Phillips, one of his other aliases, for he was a man of many names. Is that why they have so many aliases? So that they may equivoc- equivocate? Did you, Priest uh, uh, Garnet, have anything to do with this plot? No, but my alter ego, Wally, did. You see how ridiculous this Jesuit casuistry is? That they may lie with clean conscience by simply twisting their neurons a little bit in their brain and and, and assuming another identity, an alter ego, a split personality, and blaming it on, on one of the other personalities that he's no that he's not that he's temporarily not in possession of or in the cloak of. I mean, it's just, it's it's laughable if it were not so sinful. Now, indeed, why else would a man of Gardner's stature, head of the English Jesuits and professor of philosophy in Hebrew, have so many names but for the purpose of equivocation? 
which is rank deception. Interestingly, when fellow Jesuit Francis Treshman, one of the gunpowder plot conspirators on Oxford University, edu- uh, an Oxford University educated Catholic, was arrested on the 5th of December, a book was found amongst his papers, a copy of Blackwell's Treatise of Equivocation. And importantly, it contained margin notes in Garnet's own handwriting. So he had consulted a treatise on equivocation. He knew he was guilty. He knew if caught, he would have to equivocate his way out of the trouble. And he was consulting Blackwell's treatise of equivocation and even making notes of his own handwriting in the book. And it says, when the recorder of London asked him pointedly whether he only knew of the plot through the confessional box, uh, the confessional box, Garnet admits to the court that he had previously confirmed in his own handwriting that the Jesuit Greenway told him of the gunpowder treason, not as a fault or a sin confessed, but as a thing of which he, Mr. Greenway, had knowledge of, and which the latter told Garnet by way of consultation, and not through the confessional box. So here you see proof that Garnet was a conspirator in this uh, proposed crime, the plot to blow up Parliament both inside and outside of the confessional box. He had no defense whatsoever, especially not on the sanctity of the so-called confessional. And it says, when this fact is so put to him, Garnet merely replies that whatsoever was written under his hand was true. Thus, Garnet admitted his privy or his knowledge of the plot, apart from the confessional, which facts he attested to with his own hand and admitted to at his trial. In any event, as they say in Latin, qui tacit consentus, in other words, he who is silent consents. The back of Garnet's main defense is thus broken. Garnet is next, is next asked whether he has made aware, uh, whether he was made aware of the plans to raise money for an army from Spain, which was to be in readiness, uh, readiness once the parliament and, uh, the sovereign had been killed by the explosion. That he readily admits to, but the wretch denies that he knew for what purpose the army was raised. This army the Jesuit plotters had procured to invade England immediately after the gunpowder had blown up Parliament, leaving a defenseless and mourning England at the mercy of that wretched enterprise. But although Garnet initially denies that he knew of what purpose the army would be used, he afterwards, being demanded to speak the truth and have certain evidence presented against him, affirms and confesses that he knew beforehand of the sending of Spain for an army to carry out the invasion. Asked why he did not reveal this to the authorities, he simply answers, quote, I did conceal it after the example of Christ, who commands us to rebuke a brother in secret and not reveal his sins openly, unquote. What a slander against the memory of Christ. Upon what subject will these Jesuits not dissemble and equivocate? Garnet's imitation of Christ, for the most part, comes well short of the pattern, but in the, in the imitation of evil, he all but exceeds the example given by Christ's adversary. In Garnet, we see evinced the usual fortitude of a martyr after the Ignatian model that modeled by Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuit order. The author continues, he says, At the close of the court's inquiry, Lord Northampton, quite incensed, says to Garnet, quote, For though you pretend to be, uh, excuse me, for though you pretend to have received a deep wound in conscience at the first revealing of the plot, and to have lost your sleep with vexation of spirit, to have offered and prayed to God for his uh, uh, preventing grace. Yet all this while you suffered the project to proceed. You helped and assisted their endeavors that that were uh, 
that the, their endeavors that were laborers. You wrote earnest letters both to Baldwin and to Creswell, and also to Fox. For their furtherance of ordinary means, you gave order for a prayer to be said by Catholics for their prosperous success. Unquote. Says Lord, Lord Northampton, continuing, continuing his address to Garnet, quote, while you pretend to have broken both your sleeps and your brains, it may be that your mind was perplexed and disquieted upon the meditation of strange events, for so was the mind of Cain, Architophel, and Judas that betrayed his master. The more you labor to get out of the wood, the further you creep in. But Garnet offers no reply other than to repeat what he had already said about the seal of the confessional. The evidence concluded, the Attorney General Sir Lord uh, Sir Edmund Coke, in his closing address, says of Garnet, quote, He is a doctor of the Jesuits, that is, a doctor of the five D's, that is, dissimulation, deposing of princes, deposing of kingdoms, daunting and deterring of subjects, and destruction, unquote. The jury then retires to consider the evidence presented. Within less than a quarter of an hour, they return with a decision. The English superior of the Jesuits, Henry Garnet, is found guilty by unanimous verdict. Having been found guilty of high treason, John Popham, the Earl of Suffolk, and Lord Chief Justice pronounces the sentence for treason on him. Garnet was to be hanged, drawn, and quartered on May 3, 1606, and so on the said day he took his last breath in St. Paul's Churchyard, London, at age 51. In a letter dated, in a letter dated May 2, 1606, the day before Garnet was hung, Sir Dudley Charlton mockingly prophesied, Quote, he, he will equivocate at the gallows, but he will be hung without equivocation. Indeed, Garnet's infamous Jesuitical equivocations were satirized by Shakespeare in his famous play Macbeth. And we'll continue with the reading of this uh, the chapter about the gunpowder plot and the conviction of uh, Henry Garnet, the, the Jesuit priest, when we return from the break. You're listening to Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. We'll be right back. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe, so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org C-R-O-S-S CrossTheBorder.org 
to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit Cross the Border. Dot org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's crosstheborder.org. Okay, welcome back to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. Now, what of this? What of this horror that could only by the grace of God been revealed before it took place? What does it say about the Jesuit order? What are we to learn from this, from this, this book? And I'm telling you, we're only just getting started in this book. There's much more to go about the horrors committed in the world by this company that calls itself Jesus, the company of Jesus, the Jesuit order. Knowing to what length they would go to overthrow the British crown and to destroy Protestantism in Great Britain and to reestablish a papal king over England, what what would they do here in this country? You know, Great Britain kicked out the Jesuits. They knew their Jesuit enemy. They'd uncovered their plots, exposed them in court, convicted them, and executed them. But they've never had a glove laid on them in this country. You can't find anyone in the mainstream media would even mention the Jesuits, but in a favorable light. And it's considered politically incorrect to even talk about this history. So they don't talk about it. What horrors has this demoniacal organization committed in this country without our knowledge? And to whom did they place the blame for their crimes? And what outcomes have been taken as a result of blaming someone else? You know, if you're a regular listener to Inquisition Update, I'm referring to 9-11. Was that our gunpowder plot? Especially given the fact that the principles in the government on the day of 9-11 were predominantly Knights of Malta, an accessory organization to the Jesuit general in Rome. You have to at least ask yourself the question, 
Was our own government responsible for 9-11? I'm afraid that's a subject we don't speak about enough here on Inquisition Update. And I trust my listeners to do their own research into 9-11. Find out who actually did 9-11 and for what purpose. And when the opportunity presents itself, that's a subject that I intend to broach here on Inquisition Update and focus on for a good long period of time. The Jesuits are not even discussed in this country. And it's time for us to know the truth about the Jesuit order. Now, continuing with the book, it says, even if we are to believe that Father Garnet was not directly involved in the gunpowder plot, as it seems clear he was, he could not claim innocence as the plot itself was but a fruit of the Jesuits' own doctrines and instructions and drawn wholly out of their propositions and principles. And I will just add, it's consistent with the very terms of their oath. They are commanded, even in their oath, to to incite wars between parties that were previously at peace and that it's no sin to kill a heretic and their mo- their their motto uh, of uh, I used to necker regis impious it is lawful and just to kill heretical kings governments and rulers they're taught even in the jesuit schools that it is lawful to kill a heretical king Now, what is a heretical king? One who is not Catholic. I mean, if you you don't believe that this Jesuit oath is authentic, and you don't believe that the constitutions of the Jesuits, as exposed in France, are authentic, then God gives us a recipe on how to determine the truth. He said, ye shall know them by their fruits. And if you're in doubt about the Jesuit oath, or you're in doubt about the content of their constitutions, just look at what they do. Their fruit is very much consistent with that oath and with that constitution. And it's it's time for us to look this matter squarely in the face. And not just know about it, but to do something about it. Aren't we responsible, God-fearing people? Do we just keep this information to ourselves and not warn everyone else, not try to make this a public discussion? Trust me, it was a public discussion in Britain, and they managed to suppress the Jesuits but not before the Jesuits incited civil wars, regicides, Spanish armadas, many attempts to overthrow the government. How long before the American people begin to wake up? Why is not our government responding to the people? Who are they responding to? The answer is in this book. All we have to do is take a look at history and take a look at the scriptures and it paints a picture that is so easily recognizable it is a shame. Worse than that, words can't describe what it is. It is an absolute shame that this country hasn't come to this realization long before now. Just judge them by their fruit. The plot itself was but a fruit of the Jesuits' own doctrines and instructions and drawn wholly out of their propositions and principles. Moreover, he wrote several letters to the plotters giving moral support to their scheme, even calling upon Catholics to pray for its success. 
Significantly, three years earlier in 1602, Garnet had received briefs from Pope Clement VIII directing that no person unfavorable to the Catholic religion should be allowed to succeed to the throne of England. So there was a papal thunder from the throne of St. Peter, the vicar of Christ, the biblical antichrist, never to allow a Protestant to sit on the throne of Britain. And who are we to even suggest that the Pope hasn't exercised that same authority here in Protestant USA? Are you beginning to figure out why the government doesn't seem responsive to the people? The Bible clearly tells us all the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. Was God kidding? Can we understand now what the Lord of glory was trying to tell us? The kings seat themselves, and they give their power and strength unto the beast, not the people. The people are the power and strength of a nation. And we're given over to serve as papal proxy warriors for the Pope. 9-11 was an inside job. Our own Jesuit-controlled government did 9-11 and blamed it on the Muslims. Now we have heretic Protestants and liberal Catholics in this country fighting and dying in a papal proxy war to kill off the Muslims and to gain access to their territory and their oil resources and to help secure the Middle East for an eventual reign of the Pope on God's holy hill in Jerusalem. That's what this is all about. But we in this country aren't aware of the gunpowder plot, and we have no suspicion that the Jesuits after once even learning what a Jesuit is, might conduct a similar operation in this country as the gunpowder plot of 1605? It's time to wake up. Continue, it says, the reader may judge whether the following revelations by the author Jardine does not decide conclusively the guilt of the Jesuit Garnet and his order. This writer brings forward a most striking fact. He says that from the time of King James I's accession until within a fortnight of the 5th of November, Catesby and Garnet were found in constant and confidential communication. Indeed, Jardine tells us that Gatesby had been an accomplice with Garnet in two previous treason plots. Thus, in Garnet's guilty verdict, the consequences of his doctrine's previous actions came home to roost. In other words, they're just lucky to have convicted him on the gunpowder plot. He'd already been involved in several other plots to overthrow the Protestant crown. You think Protestantism might be a target here in this country? Ask yourself if this could happen in Britain in 1605. What have we missed? the Jesuits trying to do in this country to overthrow Protestantism. What about the ecumenical movement? How are our presidents elected? How is it that a man who is obviously not a natural-born citizen, as required by the Constitution of the United States to sit in the Oval Office, how is it that he's now president? And who's spreading the propaganda around the country that, well, he's in office. It's too late to do anything about it now. Who's responsible for that propaganda? And if it was so important to get Barack Obama in the Oval Office, in spite of the fact that he's not a natural-born citizen of this country and is not qualified under the Constitution to be the president, what is he? I'm suggesting to you that he's a papal king. He's not a president elect, elected under the Constitution of the United States. He fits an entirely different definition, one defined by Rome, 
not by our Protestant Constitution, the Bill of Rights. That's why nobody can bring a successful case to trial to question Barack Obama's qualification as President of the United States because he's not President of the United States. He's a papal king. He was put in office apart from the Constitution, and the Constitution can't even be used as a basis to prosecute him. That's why the courts won't listen to anybody's cases. The Jesuits have so much control in Washington, D.C., they've literally overthrown the Constitution. Just like G.W. Bush said, it's just a G.D. piece of paper. They've redrawn the borders of the country. It's no longer the United States of America. It's the North American Union. And when you redraw, you arbitrarily redraw the boundaries of a nation to include adjacent nations. What does that do, ipso facto, to your Constitution? It renders it null and void. And that's what it is, null and void. And we can just simply judge them by their fruits. They have to do because in their So what happens to Protestantism now? We have to comprehend that the object of all this, just like in Britain at the time of the gunpowder plot, the target was Protestantism, believism. And we can hardly claim that there are any Protestants left in the country. Now, what the movement has gone... No. Where will one go to find a non church? Our silence is about to come home to roost. Our silence is about to come home to roost. The enemy has infiltrated the very halls of our Congress, the Oval Office of the White House and the Supreme Court. The justice system acknowledges that Barack Obama is not a president elected under the Constitution of the United States, and they can't even rule against him. They won't even hear a case against him. Somebody else's control of our government. We lack the wisdom that the Protestants had even in Great Britain. And what they failed to accomplish in England, they have accomplished in this country without even a whimper from God's people. Okay, I'll uh, finish up the program on the telephone. I'm not sure what happened to my Skype connection, but uh, listen, uh, what uh, Udeman says in his apology, that Garnet did not approve of the deed, that is, the blowing up of Parliament, but he kind of liked the result that might have followed. And what does that tell us? That is the Jesuit maxim, the end justifies the means. If the end desired is good, any means to achieve it is also good. Now, Garnet simply concedes that he didn't approve of the deed, but the end justified it, or the planned end justified the deed. Truly, he was a Jesuit. His words outed him. Would anybody in this country recognize a Jesuit? Some of us would, but far, far too many would not. And that's why they they operate unhindered in the country, without suspicion. Now, it's perhaps also a matter worthy of note that 
Garnet had come into England 20 years previous, July 1586, the very year another Catholic, Anthony Babington, was executed for involvement in a plot to murder Queen Elizabeth I and free the Catholic pretender Mary, Queen of Scots, Bloody Mary, the Roman Catholic Queen. Elizabeth was Protestant, and they wanted Mary, Queen of Scots, back on the throne. So they tried to kill Queen Elizabeth. That was two years in anticipation of the great Catholic armada of Spain spent, uh, sent to invade and conquer England for the Pope. Reader, do all these revelations not make your hair stand on end? As the lawyers say, res ipsa liquitur, which means the thing speaks for itself. To quote Lord North Northampton, he gives a Latin phrase here, I won't attempt to read it, but it, it means what works in the human breast, the savagery of the wolf, the rabidness of the dog, the venom of the serpent, all found in the doctrines of the Jesuit order. For when the conspirators doubted in themselves of the lawless of the lawfulness of the plot, they were reassured of its justice by the Jesuit testman, who gave them full absolution of any sin and confided to the uh, confided the same to Garnet. Truly, I have not seen nor ear heard the like of these things. What horrid animus from this synagogue of naughty men! As an aside, we note, too, that gunpowder is the invention of Berthold Schwartz, a German priest, who's also said to be the inventor of firearms. Why would a priest even think about creating gunpowder? There's no fitter conclusion to Garnet's trial than the words of the Earl of Sal uh, Salisbury. Quote, Poor Henry Garnet might have undergone a more ordinary trial in some other place of less note and observation, but this opportunity has put into his, that, put into his, that is the king's hands, whereby there might be made visible to the world an anatomy of popish doctrine, from whence these treasons have their source and support. There's not a fitter stage for this exposure than the city of London. At that time, the seat of Protestantism basically in the world. And it's in history. We understand the Pope's intent to rule not only Protestant England, but the whole world. But Father Henry Garnet's story did not end with his death. Relics and reminders of him were savored and passed secretly among his followers. Other Catholics acquired different parts of his apparel, which according to the Jesuit Gerard are now esteemed more than their weight in gold. And Petrus Rabadnera, in a book published with the approbation of the Pope, reckons Garnet, Softwell, Old Corn, and other gunpowder pot traders to be martyrs of the Society of Jesus. Garnet has been given the aureole of martyrdom and is today regarded by his church, the Roman Catholic Church, as a saint. Yes, Saint Garnet, Garnet of the Gunpowder Plot, a man of many names, but of no good name. None of Garnet's actions should surprise us, as it was the founder and the first general of the Jesuit order, Ignatius Loyola, who mined all such treasures of Jesuit sophisms. On Ignatian principles, a Jesuit could justify any act of con uh, any act by convincing himself that it was for the glory of God. Loyola wrote, quote, It would be greatly advantageous, too, not to permit anyone infected with heresy to continue in the government, particularly the supreme government, of any province or town, or in any ju judicial or honorary position. Loyola also taught his order such niceties as Wrong is right when it is for the gain of the Roman Catholic Church and the end justifies the means, or by any means necessary. Thus the gunpowder treason plot was merely a fruit of the poisonous tree, 
Was not Christ telling us the truth when he said, You shall judge them by their fruits? The Jesuit order is a rotten fruit from a rotten tree, and it's time for us to know about it and to do something about it. Thanks for listening. We'll join you back here again tomorrow on the broadcast. You can listen to the Inquisition update. I'll see you tomorrow. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for missionary radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn, the Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a re-established Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions, and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit Cross the Border org c r o s s cross the border dot org to get your print epub or pdf version of nicholas arthur's new book titled when the third temple is built that's cross the border dot org